Springfield, I believe this is July 9th, Sunday. This is the World Religions New Thought class here in Springfield, Missouri. My name is Paul Bay, if anybody's online and doesn't know who I am. And uh, it's a wonderful day. <laughs> I did want to um, say something about yesterday, and some of you were here. Um, but we lost another church member yesterday, uh, Kevin Evans. And Sue was commenting yesterday on, wow, we've lost three regular church members in the last few weeks. Uh, we lost Jessica Hart, and then we lost Jenny, and now Kevin. And it's like time to stop. <laughs> yeah. Stop yeah. it. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, this, is, this is hard, and it, it affects me to a really, really great degree. I, uh, sure. I just, I can't, I can't express how much. Each one of those losses really right. is in me, and there's and there's never a point where I'm going to not miss them yeah. and not miss being right. here. So, um, especially when they play songs like "Goodbye Friend." Yes, <laughs> that was emotional. I know. Yeah. Or James, one of you, could I get you to pass these sure. out? Let the gum be. Oh, okay. So. Um, let me just kind of establish uh, ground rules here um, at, at the beginning. So I want this to be more of a discussion type of class rather than me just putting out information and you listening and doing whatever you wanted, falling asleep or taking notes or whatever you want. <laughs> this is for you to really participate in. So uh, I do want more comments than what would be normal maybe for a class. At the same time, I'm going to ask that you keep those comments somewhat short, you know, maybe a minute at the most. Try and keep them succinct. Uh, try and be clear. Uh, try and keep on subject. Sometimes we tend to stray, and, and, and sometimes that's fun. <laughs> Raise your hand But in first. order... <laughs> sorry, Greg. Raise your hand first. Well, that would be great, because Greg has the microphone in the back. And he's going to be passing it around so that when you do speak, um, it'll, the microphone will pick up online. And so those who are watching online will be able to um, hear the comments, hear the questions, hear the comments also. So with that, let's go ahead and just center. And as you just place your feet flat on the floor. Close your eyes and just find that spot that just feels really relaxing to you. Take a deep breath in and let it out. In. your body relaxing from the top of your head on down relax the eyes the eyebrows ah the mouth and jaw let the shoulders go relax feel your chest just taking in that deep breath and letting it go all the tensions of the morning all the tensions that have been upon us the last few days let it go all the way down through your hips, your thighs, your knees, and let that divine energy flow from the top of your head on down through your body, through your feet, and into the earth. And let that be just a continual cycle of rejuvenative rest and relaxation 
and comfort, knowing that the divine is present. The divine is here right now, and it's for you because you are divine. And with that, we each thank God for all that we have and all that we are and everything that we express and take in to be goodness. Namaste. Uh, paper to John. <laughs> Hi, Dee. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, I have to have to say I've been extraordinarily busy in the last few weeks. Um, I've had company for weeks and weeks and weeks. They just well, <laughs> we had the best time ever. <laughs> but uh, I've also been trying to fix up a house that I built personally out in the country and now I'm selling it and I have to do a lot of remodeling so I haven't had a lot of effort to put into my talk but that's beside the point this stuff is really pretty powerful stuff and I'm it speaks for itself now I was uh, a yoga follower for many years back in the 70s 80s 90s and I still do the practices today but I'm not formally active in that group but these are taken from uh, the words of my teacher. Uh, many would call this person a guru. This person died back in the 80s. Um, all of these quotes are taken from many talks that he's given, many books that he's written. They uh, are somewhat specific to their time and place. Uh, they come from India. Uh, he had no relation to the United States. He was never in the United States. But if you read some of these, you would think they were written yesterday <laughs> here in the United States, okay? And so my talk is on spiritual progress and social change. Now, here in Unity of Springfield, historically, we've always done spiritual progress, right? I mean, you know, you look at, uh, you look at the early teachings in Unity, uh, they did have they did work on social society issues no question about it but so much of it was about that <clears throat> spiritual <clears throat> side okay it was about following Jesus it was about following that love of Jesus it was about meditation uh, and so on and so forth healing, <laughs> healing absolutely and you know if you um, were to follow A Course in Miracles, if you were to follow Abraham, you would see that, that practice, those practices are mostly spiritual progress. One of, the, one of the points to unity is called action, right? So action is that which is what I'm going to be talking about as social change, okay? Um, and there's there was a headline in the newspaper today. I don't know if anybody gets a newspaper. I'm old fashioned. I pick up the Springfield newsletter. I go out there at five in the morning, pick up the newspaper off my driveway, and bam, there it is. You know the news. Now I also get it online too, so I'm not totally old fashioned. <laughs> but and I, I meant to bring it in, and what what did I do? I grabbed the rest of the paper except the front page. Front page. <laughs> So I could have pulled out the comics and read them, that would have been good, but uh, if you looked at the front page, right there, the headlines were about Schweitzer Methodist Church. Here, just, and our church, uh, not our church, this building originally was built for the Methodists who went over to Schweitzer and became part of Schweitzer. Mm -hmm. It's about how the Methodist Church is being split now. And I don't know if it's half and half or 70 30, or I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but if you know, we're kind of in the middle between Schweitzer and United, uh, or I mean, uh, King, um, Kingsway, is that what it's called? Methodist, right down Lone Pine here, right behind us. I think it's called Kingsway. Big church over there. One of them is leaving and going to the Global Methodist Church. 
and one of them is staying with the United Methodist Church. And what's that split all about? Anybody know? Inclusivity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Inclusivity. Sorry, that's, that's my home church. Right, okay. Sister. Got it. Uh, so my dad is well, if you get a chance to get on, you know, the news leader, you know, online, read about that article. It's 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 right there. I mean, it's where we're at in society right now, and that's part of what I I also want to deal with this issue a little bit more at the very end of the talk, if possible, because this is about social change, and it's about maybe what our community is kind of going through or really being cut apart by, you know. And uh, uh, it feels like at Unity of Springfield, I mean, that is so far in the distant past. <laughs> it's like, what? They're still arguing this issue? <laughs> and yet, as Sue would say, because I asked her this morning, I said, I don't recall Jesus ever talking about sexuality. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> She goes, no. no. <laughs> and, and isn't that eye-opening that that is what is pulling churches apart right now? It's like, boom, mind-blowing to me. It says there's 75 other churches, just so you know. 75 other churches. Oh, yeah, in the area, in the southwest yeah. Missouri. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And there's a few, like one in Nixa, one in Willard. Uh -huh. um, and I can't remember all the names of them, but it's, it's kind of interesting. So good morning, Steve. Hey. Hi. Hi. Okay, so let's kind of get started. Um, again, I'm just going to throw out, what's your picture of spiritual progress? Again, I'm going to try and encourage a little bit of participation here. What is spiritual progress in your mind? Go ahead, Pat. I feel like... I'm not going to wait. Oh, sorry. I was talking. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I, I feel like you have to know people and really get to know them okay to care about them and okay. when you do all of that falls away okay because as i've gotten to know people that are different from myself yeah it it helps me love everyone more yeah because th there's a single thread it's what um fillmore found when he was researching religion, mm -hmm. there's a single thread among us all mm -hmm. that is like a golden thread that he described right. in his early years, um, that once we get to know enough people that are diverse enough, all of that will fall away. Yeah, thanks, Pat. And so some of it is just not knowing enough people. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Spiritual progress, what is it? Go ahead, Pat. Karen, uh, uh, just a second. A second. Oh. You have to wait. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> it's about caring about people and wherever they are, just okay. be there for them and let them speak to you and then don't judge them. Okay. All right. And John. Yes. I'm a runner. Finish. What? Where? Oh, <laughs> back there. <laughs> It's about change. Hey. <laughs> Good. Okay. It's about change. Okay. okay. Did I miss that? So how do we, how do we how do we get spiritual progress? How do we do that in our lives? We you know we're born. We are raised by parents. Those parents may not be so much into spirituality. They might have a different view of what you perceive now of as spirituality how do you get there how what are the processes that take place to get you to have progress well go ahead john first you got the you're close I for me it's about looking inward okay got to it. spirit okay thanks john i like that looking inward stella <laughs> I'm going to keep you really busy today, Greg. Talk For me, it's about acceptance okay. of whatever the circumstances are, okay. which goes hand in hand with not okay. passing judgment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Some of the things that I <coughs> perceive that is going to be helping me in my spiritual progress are going to be practices that I might do. Okay. 
in unity. They might be affirmations. They might be prayer. They might be visualizations, meditation. These are personal practices that I can do to help me become more aware of myself and who I truly am, not just the outer shell, but who is, who is that which is Paul on the inside? Who is that which is James on the inside? Who is that which is Cat on the inside? And so on and so forth. So we do these things to elevate maybe our crude, more crude tendencies. Um, I would offer to suggest that that's why we're here. <laughs> we come to unity, don't we? Or maybe any area of spirituality because we have an interest in really developing ourselves into who, for who we really are. So that's social, that's spiritual progress in my book, okay? Um, so let's go, what does it mean to have social change? Are we social animals? Are we, or is it good enough just to sit in the cave your life and meditate the whole time in the Himalayas? You know, what's, what's social change? Pretty sleepy crowd here today. <laughs> Uh-oh. Pat. <laughs> Well, my um, objection to that is um, helping others, yeah. listening to them, making sure where they are, and helping them wherever they are okay. to go forward. Okay. Yeah. I like that, Pat. Thanks. And we've got Tamara in the back. <clears throat> so this is so exactly the arena in my life right now. And okay. You can be... So I was sharing with Steve that you can, I have always thought that listening at a meeting and interacting with someone and sharing whatever I had to contribute to that was, was giving. Okay. I'm now seeing it as it can be taking, you know? So if I'm fully okay. giving you my attention while you're yeah. sharing yourself, it might be that what I'm giving you is helping you to be present and feel and hear yourself and do the learning that that accommodates without me right. having to figure that out or say the right words or whatever. Right. So it's a new giving, taking thing that I'm... That this okay. Thank you. And I like the word you use there, giving, because I think in social action, we're all children of God. We're all at a certain level and it's in giving, giving of ourselves that we can affect social change. Anybody else? John. I wish we all had a microphone. <laughs> For me, um, what points towards wanting to act in social change is the concept of justice. Okay. In social Got justice. It. Okay, thank you. I love that. Go ahead, James. So I also, I don't know how to really articulate this, but I, I was also thinking that when you look through, just historically, the changes that have been made and how we treat people is totally different than how we treated people 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. And so I, I sort of think that it's, it's an evolution and kind of what you were talking about with, you know, we're all children of God. Some of that is being aware of that. Even, you know, like we have these political divides, we can become so frustrated and angry, but they're just children of God. And I, so I think that a lot of it is just associated with the evolution of consciousness. Okay. And that produces social change by its very nature. And that's, you know, Perfect. as we evolve, we become more inclusive and, you know, our systems change to, right. to reflect that state of consciousness. So. Thank you, James. I love that. Rachel has a comment in the back. <laughs> umbrella over all of it, I would say that we're kind of all saying it depends on what you're paying attention to, and effective social change means we have to pay attention to different things than we have in the past, and for some people that means I need to pull myself out and sit in a cave and meditate, okay. <laughs> and Absolutely. for some people they need to dig in Absolutely. and pay attention to what's happening right in front of them. Yeah, and 
part of my point, at, at the end of this talk, I'm going to state that unless we do spiritual practices, unless we have spiritual progress, much of our actions can actually be harmful. <laughs> and social, social change, therefore, is not in necessarily a positive direction. Okay? So it's really, really, really important that we do those things to help understand who we are and the world around us before we try and take that action. Okay, and so I think Rachel will help. Yeah, the, the, the knowing of what you're doing, and not like the gnosis is yeah. what allows you to actually affect change and not just kind of yeah. blindly lash out. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, go ahead, Pat, and then I, I'm gonna go ahead and change this subject here. I think when we know the truth about ourselves, exactly, and and know that no one can limit our good in yeah. any way, yeah. that no one can diminish or um, is needed to expand ourselves, yeah. then um, we can grant that to everyone. Okay, but good. knowing the truth is a, a key to me. Yeah, thank you very and when much. When we do good, we allow everybody else. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go ahead, Steve, real quick. Um, there's a quote, and I don't remember who said it, but I really like this. It's uh, concerning your your purpose, you know, it's, and it's uh, don't choose what you think the world wants. Choose what makes you come alive, because okay. the world needs people that have come alive. Yeah, thank you. My definition of what I would call social change is trying to create, always striving for heaven on earth. Okay. Heaven on earth. So if our actions are in the direction that we're trying to make things better, not only for ourselves, but for everybody, all inclusively, that we're trying to, the world is going to be a better place, it's going to be a cleaner place, it's going to be a loving place, it's going to be a forgiving place. Those things are, in my mind, are heaven on earth. Now, that's just my own definition, okay, and you can have your own. But I have to think, okay, if I'm going to try and make myself a better person through my own spiritual progress so that I can have an effect with my actions, I have to ask myself, is this actually going in the direction of creating a little bit closer heaven on earth, okay? That's the way I look, that's the way I perceive, okay? So let's go ahead and get some of, these are just quotes taken out, I mean, I just pulled these out of books. <laughs> and I love these quotes, these are from my teacher. Um, again, they go back into the 50s, generally 50s to the 80s because that's when this person died, okay? Um, the first one, who wants to read it? Number Anybody? One. Number one. <clears throat> Go ahead, Tamara. It is action that makes the person great. Be great by your sit on and spiritual practice, by your service and by your sacrifice. Great. Okay, thank you. We call that sadhana, by the way. Sadhana is uh, actually effort for spiritual practice. Meditation if you're in yoga. Okay, so <clears throat> action is part of the, one of the precepts of unity. Okay, um, by your service, by your sacrifice. We came up with those in some of the definitions that people um, said here. So service is the key to social change. It's service that we might do um, to one another. Number two, anybody, Steve. Today you have you have to create the great universe and the guiding principle behind it will be that all humans are the progeny of the supreme progenitor, God. Thus all are God's children, all should live together. All will have to live together. Black or white, literate or illiterate, small or tall, all are the children of the same God and all will have to live together. There will be unity in the physical realm and also 
in the psychic and spiritual realms. But to strengthen this unity still further, there should be a common goal for all the children of the Supreme Being, the merger of all in God. All have come from God, and therefore all will remain together. But this is not sufficient. All will merge in God, therefore all people will have to live together. For you, unity is the natural course, and division is unnatural. You, you will know that the cosmic energy will not long tolerate what is unnatural. Okay. Any thoughts on that? There's a lot there. Um, you know, back in the uh, 18, what, um, no, 1600s, 1700s, we had a thing called slavery. Not everybody was considered the same. Go ahead, Mary. I think there's a, a general consensus we're all brought to. Like, we might have been raised to learn something, and we might repeat that for a while. But we know how it feels with us, even when we learned it, and as we go through life. And essentially, we come to this place of wanting peace, and it's not that wanting anxiety, wanting fear. Yeah. It's that yeah. wanting this place of peace and, and this, this yeah. little ground that we can all find. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Anybody else? We're all children of the same God. We're all merging with God at some point. Are we all equal or are we are we not? But we look at we look at some peoples on this earth and by golly they're not as good as us. <laughs> I hear that all the time. You turn on the news and oh my god there's some Mexicans crossing that border and we got to keep them out and I don't like Well, now, if that's coming from God, what would God say about that? Yeah. Are nations that. real? I mean, that line that you see on the globe or the map, is that real? Are governments God-ordained? <laughs> okay. okay. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. What's real and what's not? Okay. What's man-made and what's God-made? Because if we're going to work for social change, we've got to determine that. We've got to determine what's man-made and what's God-made. That's, that's my book. I'm, create, I'm trying to create heaven on earth. Okay. So, comments. Go ahead. Well, James. So I was listening to um, a lecture given by Edgar Mitchell, who uh, was the sixth man to walk on the moon. Yeah. And he, he, there's a society of people that have been to space that talk about this sort of thing, talk about what, what does it mean to be human, because when you observe, apparently when you observe the Earth from space, your entire perspective of reality shifts. And a lot of it has wow. to do with the artificial lines that we create that we call nations. Yeah. When, you, when you take a step backwards, your consciousness shifts and you become more holistic in your understanding of what community is, mm -hmm. what nation means, what, you yeah. know. And um, so, yeah, I, I found that very interesting. Yeah, that is, it is interesting. It, it's, um, God, there's something I was gonna say about what you just said there. Yeah, the, I, I pulled up the actual quote. Um, from out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that, look at the bitch. <laughs> That's great. Are all, the nation, are all nations uh, looking at people in an open, generous way? Or what are nations about? What are governments about? What are... They're out for their own self-interest, right? I mean, is that, do we all agree with that? Mm -hmm. They're looking out for themselves, okay? And so, um, let's look at Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Who's right? Is Russia right? Is Ukraine right? They're looking out for their own special interests. Are they looking at what God might want? Because that's what that's how we have to look. If we're 
right now we're, we all we, we're individuals. We have our own perspectives, right? And, and, and a government might, a politicians might, they have their own perspective. If you look at our parties right now, by golly, they have their own perspectives and they are right in their minds, right? But if we looked at what would God want, or we used to have that statement, WWJD, <laughs> what would Jesus do, you know? If we're looking at it from a higher perspective, what might be a better solution? But do we go there? Do nations go there? <laughs> you know, it's always about the same rhetoric, you know. It's about taking care of business right here. Okay, nation building, right? It's, um... So anyway, just to keep things moving, anybody else have a comment on two? Go ahead, Tamara. So there's this man, Foster Gamble, who is a member of the Foster and Gamble family. He's done a yeah. lot of work for a couple of decades. Yeah. Five movement. They came up with that if you eliminated all of the governments and all of the everything, that the thing that would apply to all of humanity and would be happily ever after is the non-aggression principle. And it goes like this. <clears throat> no one can initiate force against anyone else against their will except in true self-defense. And I'm not sure that even needs to be there. But non-aggression is the social practice of resonance. Thank you. I like that. All right, we're going to move on. Number three. Who wants to read number three? It's, it's short. It won't hurt you, really. <laughs> Remember, you get points for participation in this class, okay? And on the chart, I'm going to put stars for every time you talk. Okay? <laughs> Spirituality provides humanity with that subtle and tremendous power with which no other power can be compared. Therefore, with spirituality as the base, a rational philosophy should be evolved to deal with the physical, psychological, and socio-philosophical problems of the day. Wow, I love that. I always said Jesus was the greatest psychology ever. Because he, I mean, that's what unity is about. We are taking these thoughts from Jesus and trying to, and, 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 to help us heal our lives, right? That's what unity was started for. It was about healing. And what Jesus was doing was so incredible. And it helped us shift and become healthier and become a little bit wiser. And, 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 and therefore, wow, how it helped our earth and how it helped our world. Jesus, the great psychologist. Go ahead, Pat. Well, I, I would read the next one if you're ready. Oh, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> four, number four. Oh, you're ready to read it. I would say that. I, just, no. I really like number four. As people become more generous and broad-minded, they rise above the feelings of catechism, tribalism, provincialism, and nationalism, which evoke narrowness, violence, hatred, and meanness. Those who enter the field of social welfare with feelings of mine and yours actually create divisions in human society. Those who wish to foster the welfare of living beings as a whole have to embrace universalism as the only alternative. If we look upon universalism, there is no opportunity for violence, hatred, or narrowness. Okay. I totally support that. Okay. Mary. A, a general comment um, you know some of these things can be perceived as also creating division you know we might see something a certain way ourselves and be able to recognize something but others are not there yet and so there's a lot of people globally who aren't mm -hmm. where some of us in this room might understand things and so going through those levels of consciousness to become aware, sometimes it takes Ukraine and yeah. Russia and these situations that we don't always agree with and we see differently on, right. but it's loving acceptance of every situation. It has to be based, all of our actions have to be based on love, don't they? I mean, because if they're not, who are we? And, and what are we trying to do? And how often in a day do we come across or read about people or groups of people that think differently than we do? And we might think in a very hateful way, but what, 
what's the answer to that? Do we go out and just shoot them? <laughs> you know, of course not, you know. We have to love them. We have to love them especially. Those, that's, our first, that's our first order of business, I think, is to listen and at the same time, you know, if we can affect one person in the way that they might see a, pers a particular situation, I know I tend to just back off when I hear someone who's coming out hatefully, right? Don't we, don't we all? But if we can see them as still a child of God, and knowing that they are there in that perception for a, they're there for a reason, <laughs> whether it be their parents, whether it be their peers, whether it, the way they grew up, maybe in a violent family, who knows how they came about. If we don't take that love and try and affect change, we've only, we're only helping that negative tendency inside ourselves to grow, right? That's how I see it. And, and that's what I heard Mary saying, I think. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I have had an experience before where I, I realized that everything I ever felt guilt, shame, and regret about just melted away because it's so clearly what got me to where I was. So those people, I realized, force some change and growth in, you know, that there's a place, maybe, I don't know, but I wanted to read this last sentence again, okay. that because yeah. uh, you put this so well. If we look upon everything as our own, the question of mine and yours will resolve in universalism. There is no opportunity for violence, hatred, or narrowness. That's a great, that's a great sentence. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Pat, you're getting lots of stars. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> I like that. That's the getting lots of stars. Is Schweitzer the one by the Y? Uh, it's the one on uh, the one. Um, Sunshine. Yes. Yeah. Well, when we first moved here, mm -hmm. we attended the one by the Y, a Methodist church, okay. two Sundays for the purpose of finding the people who had taken my mother there mm -hmm. many times and the person who'd invited her to thank them mm -hmm. and so on. And the first Sunday we were there, the minister gave a wonderful sermon about the decision that was going to be made at the conference the following Sunday, or the following Saturday, I mm, believe it was, Saturday yeah, or Sunday. Yeah. And it was about ordaining gays mm -hmm. at that time. Now right. we're in a different right. period, but, yeah. but it was that Methodist church. And he explained those people who vote this way are going to look to the Bible for their yeah. rationale. And those people who vote the other way will also, and he gave the entire rationale mm -hmm. uh, as his sermon. And then he said um, how he would vote mm -hmm. and why uh -huh. within the Bible. Um, and of course, this is not a unity perspective, right. but then he, uh, and, and he, I thought it was a wonderful, sermon because he did both sides equally and he was balanced very very much so mm -hmm. um, but he gave his own perspective as the minister mm -hmm. so as as we left the service I shook his hand and told him what a wonderful job I thought he'd done and um, I said when are we going to stop drawing circles that leave people out mm -hmm. and he said can it be the day can it be the day now, the interesting thing was he was not there the following Sunday. Mm. He was let go, apparently. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. It, that instantly. Wow. And so now they have another yeah. issue yeah. in the Methodist Church, and there are going to be a lot of ministers who try to fulfill this yeah. kind of thing, yeah. and they're going to fall by the wayside. Thank you, Pat. Maybe you need to even pick up yes. some ministers. Well, I actually have a... a <laughs> Schweitzer again was where my family's gone the whole time. I, back in the day, I don't know, I think three main, three head pastors ago, um, I was I was a wee lad or whatever, but uh, after I had heard about it, but uh, it's saying, I, might, I don't know how long ago a lot of the controversy was, but it was literally the head pastor at Schweitzer. They've come a long way since then, um, but they, because, uh, uh, anyway, he uh, said it was okay for gays to be pastors. 
right, and to be preachers, and then gone in a week. Yeah. And that, yeah. was the, that was the end of his tenure. And um, you know what? Change sometimes is painful, isn't it? And we're going through a lot of painful things. Change right comes one casket at a time. Yeah. Only when we fight it. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else on number four? Okay, let's move on to five. I need a volunteer. We're going to have Pat Childers here. Yeah, so the other Pat. <laughs> As people become more number, generous. Number five? Oh, yeah, five. Excuse me. I wanted to read four, remember? I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, man. Every atom of this universe is the joint property of all living beings. This has to be adopted as a matter of policy. And after its recognition, the idea that this is naturally and that this is national, national and that is foreign. I know, foreign, that a particular person is fit for the citizenship of a particular country while others are not or have no rights at all, cannot stand. In reality, only vested interests appear intentionally interested in such illusionary matters. All people are world citizens by birth. Every human being has the right to go and settle anywhere and to live like a human being. You agree with that? <laughs> Any Every human being has the right to go and settle anywhere and to live like a human being. Pretty hard to do in some places. Huh? Yeah. Does everybody have the right to? To what? To go to another country that they want to live in and just settle down? And no. Unfortunately not. Sure. Yeah. What, keeps, what keeps that from happening? Governments a lot of times. Um, yeah, how about the their language and their culture? Uh, how can you go to China? And hang, hang on, Rick. We're going to get the microphone for you. <laughs> but I want to hear you coming. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> well, can you move to China and make it? Can, do you know how to speak Chinese? You know can you? Uh, and they have different regions. Yeah, different I think. Regions. Can you move to China and say whatever you want to say? <laughs> that might be the no. question. <laughs> I like the first sentence here. Every atom of this universe is the joint property of all living beings. Yes. If that's true, then everybody's equal. Are we equal with Mark Zuckerberg? Are we equal with Elon Musk? I, I think I heard it said the other day that um, Eight people control like I mean it was a vast amount. Eight people control like eighty percent of all wealth in the United or in the world. And it's like holy cow, how can that be? You know, we better pray for them. <laughs> so, if you're looking at it from a God perspective, is that true? <clears throat> Are you just as valuable as? any of these people absolutely should you look up to anybody or down to anybody absolutely not we are all equal in the eyes of God and you have to solidify that in yourself in order to affect change nobody is better than you nobody is worse than you that's how, that's how, that's my perspective, okay? I'm, I'm speaking out here now. I'm going to put a star on my chart. <laughs> Did that not ruffle anybody's feathers? <laughs> Are you? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> if you believe that we're all just a different aspect of God, then we are. We're all equal, but we all... Are unique in our own way, Absolutely. which makes yeah. it interesting. There you go. I love that. Go ahead, James. <laughs> I also think it's important to understand that when we talk about such a small minority of people um, having the most amount of resources, that's just an agreement that we've all made. Yeah. 
It's not, it, I mean, the, because what we're saying is, is we're identifying land ownership. And the whole idea of land ownership is a colonizing idea. Yes. And uh, another thing that I wanted to point out with this particular co uh, comment and the last one is that um, when Europeans came to the United States, they looked at the indigenous people and they, they looked at their the way that they lived and they thought it was primitive. And now we find out that actually they, they cultivated food forests so that they could just go out and, and their food was all right there, readily available for them. And it was cultivated. Yeah. And the, the European style of um, you know, food cultivation actually does a whole bunch of damage to the land instead of these food forests, which not only nourishes the people, but it nourishes uh, the animals, it nourishes, you know, and, and it's all about control mm -hmm. uh, with that European colonization style. And so uh, I did want to mention it to you with, you know, mm -hmm. all people should just be able to go e everywhere. Mm -hmm. I really would like to see us return to that more naturalistic mm -hmm. food forest idea mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, cultivation and, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah. rather than the colonization model of just controlling everything. Yeah. And that's, in, you know, to yeah. say that eight people have all of these resources, it's just because we've all agreed that that's yeah. true. You know, when I was a kid and had very simplistic and very innocent thoughts, I did not understand fences at all. I mean, I'm talking about you walk out, there's a fence there, you, there's a fence there, there's a barbed wire fence there, you go in the country, there's fences everywhere. It's like, no, this is for me just as much as anybody else. And that concept of ownership didn't exist in my innocent mind. And yet I, I really truly believe that that was probably more of a close to God type of thought than what we're now conditioned to believe, that there has to be separate ownership of every inch of land. And by golly, you can get shot if you cross that boundary. You know, Go ahead, James. One other thing, uh, I was in a mastermind group with, with a bunch of people from Europe. And uh, one of the things we had a, a, somebody that had visit, that was visiting the United States, and they laughed at Americans because everyone has their own lawnmower. They couldn't, they didn't understand. It. They couldn't conceptualize that everyone would have their own lawnmower yeah. in the United States because you only use it like what once a week, once every couple weeks. Yeah. And um, so yeah, it's it is a very it, you know some of that isn't a very a very American idea as well. And like farmland and pasture land yeah. is open to the public in, in most of Europe. Yeah, that's anybody right. can just go. It's yeah. not like they have specific parks. They anybody can just go yeah. and uh, you know be responsible of what you're doing. But so it's a very different. We, idea. we have been conditioned to believe that this is the way it has to be. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> My mentor says he can own anything by loving it and enjoying it. Yeah. And whether it's the Teton Mountains yeah. or Mount Rainier in the Northwest or what, uh, uh, floating down a lazy river, he says, I can own that. I don't yeah. have to have a piece of paper. Yeah. I can own that because it's in my heart and yeah. my mind and I love it yeah. dearly and I treat it with respect. Yeah, thank you. And, and I love to think that I know Sue and I, our property, um, we have a trail that goes down to the South Creek bike and walking trail and in order for people in the neighborhood to get down to that trail they have to go through our property and it's it's like people come to us I've had several people come to us and say you know is it okay if we walk through and it's like absolutely you know this is your this is your trail you know go through our yard I put a sign out that says no just for time's sake, we're five after ten here. Uh, number six, someone. Please make sure to put the microphone, especially ladies. I was listening on the way in. Up to your mouth so we can breathe. Striving together with the entire universe along the path of divinity is truly the greatest task for humanity. All right. You believe it? Yeah. Okay. So, in other words, 
here we are, we're universal people, we're striving to make things better, and the path of divinity is truly the greatest task for all of humanity. If we are doing these things, that we are affecting heaven on earth, that we're trying to make the earth a better place, the world a better place, that is the path of divinity. That's the path of, of godness. Go ahead. Um, in terms of reaching for divinity, I think one, one thing, and maybe it's in, in here somewhere, yeah. is um, ignorance. And yeah. ignorance breeds suspicion. Yeah. And suspicion is the opposite of love mm -hmm. and creates separation. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a huge amount of that at the moment yeah. in this country. I heard it said years ago that do you remember TM? Did anybody ever do TM, Transcendental Meditation? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so they went around doing these experiments and they would go, they would all meditate on, like all of them would come together in a city and they would all meditate on peace. And then they would take <clears throat> what the crime rate was before they did this and the crime rate, what the crime rate was right after that, well, they found out, <laughs> you know, whether by coincidence or, or fact, that the crime rate went way down when they did this, you know. And the thought is that it only takes 3% of the population to affect change in a dramatic way. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I like to believe it is. <laughs> because if you look at the gargantuan task ahead of trying to help people to understand, gee, by killing each other, this is not really going to bring about a really great resolution here, <laughs> that possibly through love and 3%, <laughs> Can actually make a huge difference. I hope it's true. That's the hundredth monkey theory. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. I love that. Number seven. Who wants to be the orator here? Go ahead, D. Thank you. Feelings of different creation are a great impediment in the spiritual practice for the infinite. The feelings that a particular person is a Muslim, another is a Hindu, yet another a Jew, and a fourth a capitalist are mean thoughts. When every living being is a manifestation of the supreme consciousness, how can you know yourself without shedding these differentiating feelings? No one is high and no one is low. We like to separate ourselves by labels. So, um, again, that's another man-made thing. Um, we, we we come together you know, in unity <clears throat> because we you know love those things that Charles and Myrtle started and and others have followed and the teachings and and has unity gone through a social change since Myrtle and Charles started? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely it has. Absolutely racial. Now, if we wouldn't have gone through that change and we only stuck with what was at the, at the very beginning, a lot of people, I think, would have fallen off and, uh -huh. you know, and just said, we, there's, there's a reason that we have social change because we're trying to be and make it better, right? That's what social change is about and so um but anyway we do have those labels you know you're a hindu you're a muslim you're a christian you're whatever it might be and you know again that's you know kind of hurting us i think by trying to separate ourselves again so because of time i think we'll just do one more number eight anybody anybody want to have the last one Go ahead, Sue. Uh, <laughs> we 
should not forget, even for a moment, that this whole animate world is a large family in which nature has not assigned any property to any particular individual. Individual ownership has been created by selfish opportunists so that they might take advantage of the defects of this system in order to grow fatter in a parasitic way. When the whole property of this universe has been inherited by all creatures, how then can there be any justification for a system in which someone receives a flow of huge excess while others die for lack of a handful of grain? Okay. That's a big one. Wow. That is a big one there. <clears throat> I have never understood how someone can own tens or hundreds of billions of dollars and not be responsible for a little boy dying in a poor country. Yes. I have never understood that. I do not understand that today. That if you, if we have given certain people the ability to have what we consider to be that much power and that much resource and they choose to use it in a selfish manner rather than helping that little boy or that little girl have a grain of rice to survive how could that not be one of the most immoral things you could do i don't understand it anybody else have a perspective on that Go ahead, Tamara. It's a little off. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there someone else? Uh, Mary first and then Tamara. Go ahead. You know, one thing to take into consideration is that individual's consciousness of where they are at that moment. And I think, you know, we might um, think about, so, someone might be selfish. We might even be selfish in our own ways. And the realization globally is that no matter how much we get, no matter how much we take, it's not going to bring fulfillment, it's not going to bring happiness. So that person that's in leadership that's doing these things perhaps, you know, there is a recognition that it's going to transcend to them as well. Thank you, Mary. And Tamara? Okay, I'm gonna say something. I want everyone to watch your mind and try to not let it go. Yeah, but that's not possible. Okay. Watch this. Okay. So you all maybe have heard that there are, how, I don't know the numbers, X number of homeless people. Okay. There's X number of houses that are empty okay. on the in the country or on the okay. planet. There's X number of food, food provisions and X number of people, and I'm losing it by not knowing the numbers, but it's like the numbers are like matching yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. as much housing as there is homeless people there's right. as much food as there is starving children yeah. And, yeah. and and all, yeah. people are fellow human beings it could be like equalized out and it could be like this yeah. equal thing so when yeah. you think that I, I find that my mind goes well yeah but you got the greed and the, you know like all the versions right. of what says yeah. well that's idealistic or that's romantic or whatever so you know yeah. maybe if more of us just practice a moment of visualizing that without any of the ra any of the peripheral fringe thoughts or feelings right. around it, and just right. have some kind of sense of yeah. well, thank not you, if, but that it is. Due to time, we're going to have to close in just a few seconds here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating in your comments, and I I was trying to ruffle some feathers here too. I wa I wanted to get you to think. <laughs> My thesis is that in order to affect social change in a positive way, we have to work on our own spirituality, on our own connection and closeness to God. And in that way, we can make a positive change. There's a lot of change going on that's not so positive, right? <laughs> and you wonder, gee, how, how did that come about? You know, it came about because of familiar patterns because of you know peer relations because of society where someone grew up and they have that hatred in their hearts they don't think other people are equal they they don't like someone you know maybe having what they might have gotten the privilege that they might have gotten <clears throat> in order to make positive social change we need to have the spiritual progress first 
And I think that's why it's so important that we concentrate on ourselves to better ourselves in order to affect that heaven on earth. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. And namaste. And we have announcements. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. You want to read them, Greg? And I'm passing the basket. I'll let you sit here. I got you. Thank you for passing the basket. Spirit Explorers Summer Camp for ages 4 to 11 starts Monday and will be held July 10th through the 13th, 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Volunteers and snack donations are very welcome. Neil Landau's West African Drumming Classes continue on Monday nights at 7 p.m. You are welcome to visit the class a few times to see if you enjoy it. Currently, there is no charge. Unity Men's Spirit Group meets Thursday, July 13th at 10 a.m. in Fellowship Hall. This is open to all men. We talk about men's stuff. <laughs> Diversity Game Night is Saturday, July 15th at 6 p.m., hosted by Bobby Delmar. Everyone is welcome. Next Sunday at 9.15 in the New Thought World Religion Adult Sunday School class, Rod Ingerson and Dee Dee Arvin will be presenting meditation techniques from a Quaker and a practitioner of transcendental meditation. That should be cool. The midweek renewal service will be held July 20th at 6.30. There will be a celebration of life for Jessica Hart on July 22nd at 2 p.m. You are invited to a fiesta in her honor afterwards in Fellowship Hall. And save the dates. Stephanie Barton will hold Stephanie Barton will hold the Angels Among Us workshop on August 27th at 1:30, and Daniel Namod will be here in concert on September 30th at 7 p.m. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. <laughs>